Welcome back to Jesse Lauscher's Physics. Today will be a short theoretical look at vectors. Although perhaps not very interesting, an understanding of vectors and their vocabulary around them is fundamental to a lot of physics, especially AP Physics 1. In the first video, we looked at quantities and units. Quantities can be either scalars, which have only a value called a magnitude, or vectors, which have both a magnitude and a direction, and are usually written with an arrow above them and typed in bold. What do we mean by having no direction? It wouldn't make any sense to say, I have a mass of 70 kilograms north, or that last time we calculated that the time it would take to fall from Taipei 101 would be about 10 seconds east. We could calculate how much work gravity does when the object falls, or how much gravitational potential energy it loses, but energy, time, and mass don't have a direction in and of themselves. Vectors, on the other hand, must be stated with a direction. If we push something with a given force, we must be pushing it in a given direction, since it wouldn't be possible to push it in no specific direction. And as a result, the object would accelerate in the direction we push it. So force and acceleration, like momentum, are vectors. Displacement and distance are both measurements of the quantity length, but distance is a scalar and displacement is a vector, so displacement needs a direction. And speed is a scalar and velocity is its vector equivalent. Let's take a look at these in more detail. First, x, or sometimes d, is commonly used for both displacement and distance, but by default most high school physics courses require students to use displacement. If in doubt, look for the arrow above or the bold typeface. Displacement measures how far and in what direction something is from the origin, which is commonly chosen to be a starting point. Here's a sample problem to show the difference. A keen cyclist rides 20 kilometers north, then 10 kilometers south, then another 5 kilometers north. For her distance, we just add them all up and get 35 kilometers. But for her displacement, we need to take into account directions and also positives and negatives. So let's assume that north is positive. Now we need to make the 10 kilometers negative and then we can add them all up. That then measures how far she ends up from her starting location, giving us a total displacement of 15 kilometers. And since as a vector, displacement always needs a direction, we'll give the final answer as 15 kilometers north. While speed equals distance over time, velocity equals displacement over time. So now let's look at an example which uses angles. Xiao Jin walks 8 meters north and 6 meters east, and we need to find all four quantities we've talked about here. For distance, it's easy, just add them up. And her speed is just distance over time, giving us 2.8 meters per second. But for her displacement, we need to take into account her direction and figure out where she ends up relative to where she starts, which we'll choose to be the origin. She walks 8 metres north and then 6 metres east. Any self-respecting physics student would recognise this as a 3-4-5 triangle. But because displacement is a vector, we're going to need to give our answer with an angle. Any good physics student should also know Sol Kartawa. So here we have the adjacent, opposite and hypotenuse. Now we could really use any of these, but since the opposite and the adjacent were given to us in the original problem, and we used them to calculate the hypotenuse, let's use O and A. So we use tan theta and get an angle of 37 degrees. There are a few ways to express this direction, but I recommend stating the angle between that direction and one of the compass directions. The most important thing is that we can't just say northeast, because we need to be more specific and use the 37 degrees we calculated. So the answer is 37 degrees east of north. I encourage my students to think of east of north as actually being east from north, because if we start with north, then we need to move 37 degrees towards the east to get the direction we calculated. Finally, for her average velocity, we use velocity as displacement over time, so it comes out at one meter per second. Now this might seem a bit strange at first, because Xiaojian never actually walked one meter in any one second. If her speed was constant, then she walks 2.8 meters every second, which is her speed we calculated before. This is where the connection to displacement comes in. Average velocity tells us how much further, on average, she moves away from the origin each second. Those examples we looked at use simple trigonometry, Sokatoa, but sometimes students in high school physics need to use the sine and cosine rules, and sometimes problems are more easily solved by actually drawing out the vectors and measuring their lengths and angles with rulers and protractors, which is allowed in most physics courses. But of course, please read the question carefully and answer as required. Logically, the length of the arrow represents the magnitude of the vector, and the direction of the arrow represents the direction of the quantity being modelled. We can then add the vector's tail to tip, and the sum, called the resultant, points from the start of the first arrow to the end of the last arrow. 
I encourage my students to draw their arrows in the middle of the line rather than the end, and to use two arrows to show the resultant. But this isn't a requirement of AP Physics or any other course as far as I know, and your teacher might require you to draw them a certain way. But I find this makes it easier to check that they're drawn tail to tip, and to identify which vector is the resultant. Here's the same vector triangle drawn without using this technique, and I think the one on the left is clearer, even aside from the different colours. Now let's look at how we can join these arrows. This is a simple example to show how they work. Here are the three vectors given in the problem, drawn to scale as vectors should be. Then we just join them tip to tail and draw the resultant from the start to the finish. Then we could either measure the length of the arrow representing the resultant with a ruler, or perhaps use Pythagoras theorem. And we could measure the angle with a protractor or use Solkatoa to find the direction. Please don't forget to state the direction with your answer. Forgetting to give a direction with a vector quantity is an easy way to lose a point or two. How did I know to join them in that order? Well, actually it doesn't matter, as long as we join them tail to tip. Here they are in another order, but the resultant vector, that's the sum of the vectors, or the answer, has the same magnitude in the same direction. However, I recommend not trying to add parallel vectors one after the other, because it can become a mess. So if we started with the first vector, we'd end up with this. We can still draw the resultant from start to finish and get the correct answer, but I think it's less clear than the first two diagrams. If we need to subtract a vector, we apply the law that a minus b equals a plus negative b. So if we want to determine a minus b, then we first find negative b, which is a vector of the same magnitude in the opposite direction. Then we can add a and negative b so that the resultant is the vector a minus b. Like to prove it? If this is a minus b, and then we add b, then to find the original vector sum, we draw the resultant from the start to the end, and we get the original vector a, as we would expect. Now let's look at what's called scalar multiplication of vectors, that is multiplying a vector by a scalar, which basically just means a number without a direction. The magnitude of the vector is multiplied by the scalar, and the direction stays the same. So if this is vector x, this is 2 times vector x. Please note that x is the vector, so it's bold and has an arrow over the top, while the 2, the scalar, is typed in plain text. For a simple explanatory example involving real quantities, let's say we want to calculate the displacement of someone who walks at a velocity of 2 meters per second for 10 seconds. This is a case of a vector, velocity, being multiplied by a scalar, time. So the velocity and displacement must have the same direction, which is logical since the person must end up in the direction that they walked. I'd like to finish with a warning of sorts. We can draw a vector diagram for any vector quantity, and sometimes we can choose which one to use. For example, to lead into my next video, let's say we have a relative velocity problem of a person swimming north across a river flowing east for 40 seconds. I'll explain what these symbols like xpg or xpw mean next time, but we could either calculate how far she will swim across the river and how far the river will pull her downstream during that time, and then add these displacements as vectors, or else we could add the velocities together as vectors, and then find the resultant velocity, and use that to calculate her final displacement. These are similar triangles, so the angles are the same, so 30 over 40 is 0.75 over 1. But we cannot say 30 over 1 is 0.75 over 40, because they're only similar triangles. The magnitudes are different, so the triangles are effectively different sizes, so I suggest drawing them different sizes as I have here. Most importantly, please never add vectors of different quantities together, because we can only have one vector quantity on one diagram. As always, thanks for watching.